All right, folks, welcome to the George Lynch Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Legendary Gear, the game call company that is legend by design. Now, speaking of legend, folks, I got some guests on this week that really need no introduction, and they're probably the, the few people in the industry that, that you don't even have to mention their last name. People there, it's a synonymous when you cross when you say Lee and Tiffany, every high people know who Lee and Tiffany are. So folks, this week, our guest, an honor to have Lee and Tiffany Likoski. Welcome on, guys. Hey, hey good. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having us. Hey, you know, we talked a little bit at the Iowa Deer Classic, and it's tough, you know, to get in and have a conversation with you two because they always seem to have a crowd. And, you know, it's awesome because it's a positive influence. That's what I think uh, raises people to the top, you know, that, you know, times can be rough and you can be knocked down, but, you know, a cream can be stirred and knocked down, but it always rises back to the top. And I always remember that. And that's what you guys, you guys are a great influence to everybody out there. And but one of the conversations, and, and I'm going to lead into this, is that um, I really didn't know. I know that you guys are unbelievable whitetail enthusiasts and, and very successful, and then hunt other big game. I didn't know that you guys were so much into the waterfowl, and that's when my old ears <laughs> did a little in there because wow, I mean, we're a lot in common. People don't don't realize that, but like I grew up in in Minnesota, and I know you grew up in uh, Michigan. And of course there were deer there, but it wasn't like Iowa. I mean, I moved here for, for deer, but so like growing up, I mean, I, we hunted in Northern Minnesota. So that's where my, my parents were from, my grandpa and everyone lived up there and I just loved it up in Northern Minnesota. But you know, the whole time I got so infatuated with deer basically because there was, there weren't any, you know, and I just thought that I just, I just figured there were deer there because I'd see tracks, but we never hardly saw any deer. So I figured it was me. So, but then, then, so that's what just got me so into deer, so infatuated with them because we couldn't ever see any, but we had great, you know, duck and goose and pheasant hunting. So I duck and goose and pheasant hunted way more than I deer hunted up all the way up to probably my thirties almost, you know, until we moved to, to Iowa. I mean, I was always just, you know, there was always deer in the back of my mind, but I remember my buddy Paul and I, it was always, you know, because the duck season uh, opened about the same time as the deer season. It's like, well, what do you want to do first? You know, what should we if you're going, we always end up going goose hunting or, or duck hunting because you knew you're going to be successful there. And we were going to see a bunch. And then, you know, the next day or that evening, we had would, dogs too. Yeah. And we yeah. had dogs and stuff for it. So then like maybe the evenings we'd go deer hunting, but yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't, don't realize is, you know, for a good part of my life up till we started the TV show, I duck and goose hunted and pheasant hunted and had dogs and we're all into that, you know, 10 times, tenfold what we were deer hunting me obviously not, not so much, i gotta say the funniest thing that we ever did like years ago we had this nra celebrity like shoot that we had to do and uh of course i i mean like i said i'm mediocre i didn't start until like well into my probably late 20s by the time i was shooting shotgun and shooting at waterfall but we had this celebrity tournament thing that we did and lee <laughs> ended up taking the whole thing won the entire thing and they were like you got to be kidding me. A bow hunter won the NRA shoot off. <laughs> and it was like all this drama. Oh. With that. Yeah. yeah. Cause you beat Craig Morgan. I think. Well, that too, it, he was he one of the celebrities that celebrities, ended but... through the end, but there was all like the NRA people. Yeah, and and it was and a, yeah, it was a sporting plays course. And, and then and it was, man, that, yeah, that's, that's, that can be humbling. Yeah. <laughs> that's that could be it's humbling. just so funny because they're all like, how did a bow hunter win this? At least like I've been shooting a uh, yeah, I've been shotgun, shooting a shotgun or... since I was born. So it's not yeah. like it was, you know, anything new That's to awesome. me. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, my son and then my daughters actually went too. We did the goose hand. I had them in pits with me and doing their homework and calling birds in. And, and but they talk about, you know, when they were younger, he says, you know, dad, I enjoyed the deer hunts, but my best times as us in the field was waterfowl hunting because, you know, we, we, we drink hot chocolate in the morning. You, you can take a lot of people and then you don't have to worry about scent. You don't have to worry about being yeah. quiet. Yeah. And there's always action. So yeah, there's a big difference. Sure there, because like I used to yep. use our kids, obviously they're, they're soon to be six and eight right now. And I'll never forget when we had that pit blind and it was so cool because we put a pit blind right on one of our pieces of property, which is really neat, you know, just to be able to like go there and it's your own piece of property and all these geese were coming in. And, but you know, you have hours of no geese coming in. And of course you got a five and seven year old at the time. And all of a sudden we're <laughs> like, there it comes. You know, the kids were like, 
<laughs> they ran yeah. in a pit, but it was yeah. So they don't fun. have a lot of pace, so they're yeah, out yeah. of the blind, running around yeah. in decoys and stuff. And also, you hear the geese, you're like, get in the blind, get on. Like, so I'm sure, yeah, they like it too because you know they can run around and do Play stuff and, and whatever until the geese start coming. So it is. I mean, uh, you know, my dad didn't ever waterfowl hunt hunted, but my buddy Paul, his that grew up just four down doors down from me, his dad. Him and his dad did so they i was lucky enough to have them take me with you know with them and, and then once we hit 16 you know we got or <laughs> paul was a year older than me so when he hit 16 and get a driver's license by then we were off to the races we were hunting some ducks and geese all over every single day you know but yeah it is, so cool. you know, it's so nice for kids and stuff that it is you know you don't have to be quiet you don't have to worry about scent and all that kind of stuff so it is you know they the kids love it you know just being outside and being able to to do it with them well you mentioned earlier and that's one of the biggest loves i've had because i grew up in michigan like you said fuzz i mean so we always had dogs you know we either had pointers wine runners and then i had some when i got more into the waterfowl and using i had one i had the labs but i also had uh chesapeake i had you know a great chessie and but it, it's people don't realize that to me if i you know i could just hunt with one person sometimes it would be my dog and I enjoyed oh, so yeah. many memories of what he would do in that, in that relationship. You know, we we kind of started something back. I wanted to do something different. And I found out that when we were doing the shows that uh, there was a lot of people would come in and they'd look at your bands, especially if you're doing a show at Cabela's or somewhere at Bass Pro and they hear the calling, they come up and the lady, her, their husbands would be looking, but the, they'd always bring the kids because the kids loved that sound. You know, so you'd always broaden that duck call or the goose call for the kids. But she'd look at my lanyard and she'd see all those bands and and she'd say, wow, what you explain what they are. And the first thing they asked was, what do you do with all that? And I, without hesitation, ma'am, I eat this. And I said, it's protein from above. And all the time, you know, the answer, their answer is, well, you know what? If you eat it, it's all right. But the people, and I always looked at, when you looked at a pie, you had hunters and anti-hunters. But there's also a piece that nobody thinks about, hunters without an opinion. People out there don't know whether hunting's good or bad. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go after those who don't have an opinion. And one of the things, there was two things, is always talking about what eating what we got, but also my dog. And I remember I worked on something. I wanted to get a different look in the video. And I started something, trademarks called the dog cam. And we created this harness and had a camera on my dog. It was so cool. I ended up with a, um, what's it called? Die? The gopro <laughs> that's it and um, for a redneck you know i thought of this up but it was the training of the dog first you know you will mess a dog's world up but old bucky boy he was amazing we made a, a logo with him and the cartoonish with the dog cam and but you would take him to a show and the people would come to that dog and when we did oh, the yeah. had graphic uh, people do my the graphics for it for our, our for the videos or whatever we were doing they weren't hunters but they would all want to watch the video because they wanted to see that dog so I learned real quick, he was a great tool to bring people and show people that, you know, we love the relationship as hunters, not just the killing and taking, but we love the moment out there and sharing it with a dog. And that actually, you know, this dog, it's what he was bred for. People think that you're doing a wrong thing and you're, you're make no, he lives for this. Oh and, my gosh. That's, you know, it's totally true. You know how many times, I mean, actually before I even became like a waterfall hunter, I'd be like, oh, they're cold. It's like, no, they're not cold. They are so excited to be out there. But you know, we have a, we lost our first lab tank uh, a couple of years ago. And then Maddie, we, so we have three dogs right now, our two dogs right now, but Maddie, um, she was diagnosed with bone cancer um, probably a few months ago now, but so we had her front leg amputated and and oh, she's wow. doing great. She's, I mean, she'll be 11 in May, but she is doing phenomenal. But the funnest thing was the other day I had her out there and the kids were throwing dummies for her. And that dog, I mean, yeah, you wouldn't know, she, she, wouldn't know she has three legs. She could care less. <laughs> she wanted to retrieve that. And we're like, Maddie, it's like, you, uh, hopefully God willing, you'll be out in the field again this year, you know, retrieving ducks and geese and stuff. But yeah, the dogs, you, you can't beat it out there. I mean, it's like, like I said, I, I could care less if I even shoot anything in all honesty, because usually we're out there with a group of people. It's like, I just like what being able to be out there and watch those dogs work because they just, it's just their passion. Absolutely. Yeah. It's incredible. They have the heart of the dogs that, mm -hmm. you know, when like even when Tank passed away, how many people, you know, even on social media and stuff came out and I mean that you know, reached out to us on that. And it was like, man, it's crazy how that, I mean, people know those dogs, even though they're not, they're, they're not a huge part of our show. They are 
when we do pheasant hunts and duck hunts and goose hunts, but really on social but media, they know they're, them. Yeah, they're, they're on, they're on our, they're a huge part of our lives. So they, you know, you see them on our social media stuff all the time, but it, yeah, it's amazing how many people love those dogs. They even, you know, even though they've never met them. You know, I thought, always thought my dog Buck was a tool and it was a great tool to use to retrieve the birds. We did the training, but when I put that camera on his head and I would go a lot of times out in the spring just to, you know, watch him and record and, and see and get him trained. You started watching that, that, you know, something that you don't see is it records what he's looking at. And all of a sudden you look and every, you know, it's usually me when I stand up or if I'm walking to a decoy, if I'm getting back in, that is, and he's either watching the sky or he's watching me. And you talk about dedication. Yeah, it's yeah. so awesome. It's just so fun to watch. You know, it's funny when you were talking about um, you either have like the non-hunters or hunters without opinion and whatnot, but Honestly, I think that's why we've never we've never had a lot of problem with like the anti hunter group at all. And I think it's just because it's like everything we do revolves around it. I mean, even our, our son Cameron shot his first buck this year. It's like we have been so it's kind of him and Lee's thing, you know, yeah. and Reggie's, but they make beef jerky like every week, venison jerky out of the deer that he harvested and he feels so prideful that, you know, he's providing for his family. And it's like that's just the you know coolest thing about it but i think that we that's probably one of the reasons we never get like the flack on right that. it's like you what see, do you it's say just, it's yeah, like that's how we just, eat that's yeah. what our kids know that's that's you know we work our land and right yeah yeah we, we, do all the work the on, we shoot mo right. all of our deer on basically on our own property that we you know work so hard on and eat everything every else day. and we you know and you're very respectful because as you know i mean we love these animals there are life i mean so i mean we have so much respect for them and things and you know you you think about it like the non-hunters are the ones that you just like you said that probably about 80 percent of the people are just they're not hunters and they're not anti-hunters they're just in the middle and those are the ones that you, you need that to you get. really have to get at mm -hmm. and even that even the I, hunters, I think if you could talk to them more i mean the thing is you're about well, we you're not on a years ago. One of a yeah, one of a our of them. buddies that was a professional pitcher was dating a famous girl, and uh, yeah, it really turned her around by the time she came. So yeah, you know, she was like, she was "Oh here. my gosh, now I get it a little bit." I I, I just thought you guys just mm -hmm. shot stuff. We're like, "Oh my gosh, that's the least what we do." Right. I think if they just, you know, you're a lot more alike than different, you know, because it's like you may love those animals and everything, but we do too. But I look at it and said, "Look at my farm." If we weren't here, there would be there would be hundreds of less animals alive today if we weren't here. Because for what we and do for friends. habitat and food and all of a sudden, sure we shoot a few, but we feed hundreds and I mean hundreds of deer and thousands of animals of all different kinds. If I wasn't on this planet right now, there would be there'd be far less deer, there'd be less turkeys, there'd be less all kinds pheasants, of birds, yeah. pheasants, everything for what we do on this. And it's like if you if you really was able to sit down and talk to somebody who was like an anti hunter and say, hey, look, we're basically ninety nine percent on the same page. I love these animals. We have respect for them. We try to keep them healthy. We keep the numbers as high you know as high as we can, and we keep them healthy and happy. I mean, there's just the one percent is like, hey, we harvest them to to eat, and you know for uh, you know for us and our family and everything, and you don't. So there's a lot more life but and different on that. To understand, like you have to hunt, you have to do practice conservation. It's like you know geese. It's like oh my gosh, if you don't, yeah, if, if you're didn't. not trying to manage some of that stuff, it's like it. They yeah, would it would starve. I mean, they'd, yeah. you, you, and they'd, they'd be dying from disease yeah. and everything else if you if you didn't. But yeah, you're a lot more alike than than different. If but they just don't a lot of, just don't realize that. I think you hit a very important point that, and that's one of the things that I try to, re, you know, as we're going forward, that she's always a great with the marketing trend, but it's, we find out that on, on if the YouTube and anything that we're doing, my educational stuff that I do is a lot, people really seem to follow. I've never been one that, especially shooting the waterfowl, you know, that ex exploiting the kill. You know, it, kill happens, you know, I kill because I hunt, you know, I used to say I kill because I hunt, but I don't hunt to kill. So, so the education thing, and I think uh, Tiffany hit a great point that the people the non opinion people, they just they need to be educated. And that's kind of like we're our stewardship runs that, you know, educating the people of what we do, we're not apologizing, we're just explaining what we do. And I why think we a do lot it. of people just don't know, though, you know, I mean, we just had um, some of our in-laws down and they were going 
to a basketball tournament. So you had a bunch of inner city kids down at our house and they were apps like 16 year old boys, you know, going to play basketball. And they were absolutely, there's Cameron out there with his gun right now. Uh, they were absolutely <laughs> fascinated that Cameron could shoot a gun, that he could blow an elk tube, he could play the guitar, he could shoot his bow. And I mean, they just thought it was, the, I wonder where he's going. Seriously. They just thought it was like the coolest dang thing. And I mean, like I said, here's a bunch of 16 year old boys. And I said, I would love to have all those boys down here during like planting season. Cause I guarantee you, they would just be, they would just love it. You know, it's like, uh, they couldn't, they're like, how far does a spotting scope? What is this? And Cameron's like, it's a spotting scope, you know? So he just thought he was so cool because he was like teaching these older boys, like our way of life down here. And they were like, like I said, they were like absolutely fascinated. I got to look where it's going. Yeah. Like, yeah Cameron's already got a gun out <laughs> on, on outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, um, we got to do some duck hunts this year together. I was talking to you, you know, I have a good friend up in New York and he has a, some of the best land, especially up by the Finger Lakes region. And, you know, we were, he was asking when I was telling you, I'd like to do, we we're going to do some hunts this year. And he said, man, tell him to come up here. I got, he's got a beautiful lodge to stay in. He's got the dogs and, or if they want to bring their dogs and, you know, but he's got some great spots where you can go hunt, you know, lots of ducks or, you know, go and we can shoot 15 honkers a day up there. And I've gone up there in three days and we have my poor Chesapeake was just covered in blood. And it wasn't his just because he was retrieving so many geese. Right. But, um, but, you know, we need to get something later in the season. I, and I told him, I said, dude, September, if you're a big game hunter, September is not a good time of the month. Right. You know, it, or year it's uh busy and if you're especially starting the western hunts and stuff like that but we definitely got to get you guys uh later we'll have to stay in touch and, and later in season we definitely can run some hunts there but i'm telling you if we can get the chance to go to new york to his place and we can i'll just get the report when he's loaded with ducks because we'll go over there and shoot mallards but we'll also get to go shoot black ducks and that's something that you know we don't get to do much here you know, that would a few black be really fun, to be honest. I mean, it's like, cause our, you know, my mom passed away almost four years ago now, and she was the only one who ever watched our kids. And so we live in, you know, Nowheresville down here. So we don't have a lot of help. You know, I have like a <laughs> local girl that babysits occasionally, but in all reality, they're with us. They're just, they go everywhere with us. They travel with us. You got dogs you got and stuff. Blood. So it, um, but you know, it's like, that's the way we keep them close. And that's what we know what they're doing and we know what they're watching and we know every step of the way of how they're living their life. So, but like now that they're getting older, it's like, I mean, Cameron's just a little rock star on stuff. You know, he's, they, they can't wait to go hunting. They're just so good out there. I mean, they just go along with everything. So, I mean, yeah. they love watching their dogs work and I mean, maybe be fun. It's a lot you easier. Know, to my point now, I'm like, yeah, it's easier now that they're here. old and not a person older living. Older now that they're actually hunting it <laughs> themselves, they're, they're easier to take along with us there rather than we don't really. Which exactly means it's easier for me to go anywhere, right? Well, you know, what's impressive is that you guys realize that and you guys are actually, you know, you talk about it's the same thing, you know, if you weren't on this earth, you know, there's a lot of hundreds of animals that wouldn't be existing. And here you got because of you guys, you got two beautiful children. It's here on this earth because of you. And you've taken the responsibility is not just wanting to be a celebrity, but you've taken the, that the importance of wanting to be a parent is more important than the celebrity. So you're doing your investment in your children. And I think that's so awesome. And Diane and I both talk, I, you know, I believe a lot in the discipline and I believe that children should be taught and they shouldn't learn from, you know, the TV and, uh, and from the game boxes and, and uh, video games. And I think video games has just crushed everybody's minds and it's all been a plan to destroy our thought process. And, you know, if I were to have kids today, um, I'm telling you, I would, there's no doubt uh, because I trust my wife that she is smart enough and be organ. It's about organization that my kids would definitely be homeschooled. It's awesome, but people don't realize the discipline that it takes. And Tiffany, you guys can probably chime, uh, chime in here that, you know, that's one of the things I picked up there in Iowa where you talked about you were homeschooling. I thought that was so cool, but can you kind of like give a day of what you're doing and, and with your kids? Cause it, it shows in your kids. Cause you're just talking about, he's a rock star. He's doing this. And he's, he's being, he's playing guitar, he, you know, he's blowing an elk tube. And I think that's because he's getting this attention and direction and, and you're teaching him the discipline. If you want to be good at something, you have to work for it. And in today's world, 
that there's so many people that both are working, you know, that the daycare center and the stuff like that. And I think kids are losing so much of the social life that they're learning either, you know, that it's all about me and I have to fight to get what I want, but you're teaching them that you got to work for it. You can't just take it from someone, you know? So I'd like to hear you kind of explain. You know what the funniest thing is the biggest misconception of people like in homeschool, they're like, how are your kids going to be socialized? I'm like, okay, first of all, they're not a dog. I'm like, and secondly, we have so many people <laughs> in and out of here constantly. And I'll never forget Matt McPherson because he homeschooled all of his kids saying, are you kidding? He's like, our kids are so well socialized, but I'm like, they talk to the mail carrier. They go to the grocery store. I'm like, you know what? When we go to the grocery store, they don't have phones, but they're not looking at my phone. They're like talking to people. They're weighing vegetables and stuff. And it's just, the biggest misconception on that, that it, it it's so hard and that the kids are almost like an inconvenience. I feel like it's like, when did they get be, um, become almost a burden to society? It's like, that's not what we should be doing with them. I and mean, it's like, this is, this is what we're raising to be a better world down the line. And it's like, yeah, it takes a lot of dedication. It takes, there's a lot of things that I don't do anymore because of that, but we know together the importance of me being home with them for the most part. And of course, Lee's around a lot too, but it's like, it's a little bit different with that. You right. Know? I mean, exactly. Still... I'm working in fields every day. She does their schoolwork and, and stuff, but it's just, I don't know. It's just so much. I think it's just so much better the homeschooling. stuff because it doesn't, it's not like it takes you eight hours a day. It's just, no. it's, a, it's two to three hours a day. And it's, it's I mean, nice. They're not at school to socialize. They should be at school to learn anyways. Right. But Right. Exactly but right. It's just like, you know, it's like, I think just for school, you know, if you're not paying attention, which kids, it's hard to keep their attention span so short, you know, just, you know, to keep them from, you know, you know, to keep them listening and keep them focused, focused and all that stuff. Doing. So it's like, like in math or anything, you know, in school that, you know, you're goofing off one day, the class keeps going on. It doesn't like for us, it's nicer. Our kids, you, know, you learn it. Okay. You're not moving on until you have this. And so you know that each step that they are understanding anything before you move on. But more than anything, I think they're just that they're with us all the time. And we just, you know, we do school year round. So, you know, there's time like hunting season that, you know, or if we're busy or if we're out planting and Cameron loves to be out in the tractors with us and, and stuff. So it's like, hey, if, if we don't do it every day. We yeah, we miss it. School. yeah yeah that's like school, so but. much more stuff that even on that because like a lot of times we're just such good we just work together i'll be like okay lee i need you because i'm in all honesty i still couldn't tell you the barely the direction right now i could be like ah i think that's south but um i'll be like okay hit on this 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 and this you know and there's so much more to it than just math reading science whatever i mean it's like it just is you could do whatever i mean you could take it as far as you want but it's like i just think of like even just raising, you know, I feel like a lot of the education stuff, I mean, let's be honest. It's like, Lee is a chemical engineer. Well, do you know he like failed out of math for like years? It's like, okay, well, he became a chemical engineer. You know why? Because he wanted to do it. So when you get them to be at the point where they're like, okay, I better just sit down, focus and do this, then I'll do it. But it's like the biggest thing even right now is just character building and just raising decent children that know the difference between right and wrong. And so as they get older, they can make those decisions on themselves or, you know, they could be like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, it's like, and honestly, like we went to, um, I, sh my, I, sh I won't say it too loud, but uh, there was a video game that was Cameron was playing and I was like what is he shooting people and stuff I'm like Cameron's never seen a video game in his life and then somebody he was else playing, was playing somebody it, else yeah. Was playing it, yeah and then there was a Mario Kart one which of course I remember Mario Kart when I was younger and stuff but he was like yeah I didn't even like that shooting one I mean you're not supposed to aim guns at things like that that's just silly why would you do that he's like I like the driving one so because I like to drive and stuff but I was like oh my god look at they do listen and, you know there's because there's some days where I'm like what am I doing? I'm going to send you both to school so I can get a life back again, you know, for eight hours a day and do what I want all day long. But in reality, I'm like, oh, I'm listening. and even Cameron the other day, because both Cameron and Reagan want a turkey hunt this year. Cameron's shot two turkeys already, but he's like, hey, mom, and dad, I think I think Reagan should shoot first because I've already shot turkeys. So I think she should go first. And I was like, oh, but, uh, we're raising good little humans. And, you know, the part will man. come eventually anyways you know when they have to learn to do stuff but i mean obviously they're doing good anyways right. but still it's just yeah like matt mcpherson said this one time he was like you know the bad habits that they pick up or language or whatever it's not from, from school yeah, it's it not from, from us because my kids deal with adults every day you look them in the eye and you shake their hand and say how are you sir and 
you know, very respectful. And that's the way I want them to be. I don't want them to be, you know, hearing this stuff in school. But, you know, so I, just, I mean, kind of the same way. It's, I it's think very our kids respectful. talk to everybody. I mean, we just did like an impromptu trip to Vegas a few weeks ago. And it's like we walk on the airplane and I'm like, you, I prepare them. I'm like, OK, now when you get on, there's going to be the flight attendant there. You look them in the eye and say, hello, thank you for having whatever, you know, and as you could say hello to the pilots and stuff. And I said, because now it's gotten everybody's just sitting there on their phones and nobody looks up, especially those younger kids. And I'm like, that is ridiculous. It's going to get to the point where people don't even speak. And I just refuse to give into that. I'm like, I talk to freaking everybody. I say hello to everybody. Our kids say hello to everybody. They say goodbye. They see our armed enforcement forces and our military and stuff. They say, thank you for your service. And it's like, like I said, we're just raising good little humans. Yeah, it's and funny because just the little things that you take for granted, like our kids walk on the airplane, you know, and hey, how are you? And stuff. And how many people, I, I like you when we went on that trip, it was like 10 different times. People like, oh, you have the nicest kids. And it's like, that should just be normal. That should be every kid. But it's just yeah. because they don't hear that anymore. I mean, we, people, you know? we went on. And and we were... you have a five and a seven-year-old are the only ones on the plane saying, good morning. Good how morning. are you? How Except, are you? you know, but maybe they'll don't change somebody, that. I figure, you know, between me and, I mean. But uh, it was so funny when we went through security at the lady. And it was a four-hour flight to Vegas from St. Louis for us. And the lady's like, okay, do you have any any electronics in your bag? And I'm like, no. And we're on Southwest, so there's no TVs on there. And she's like, no switches, no iPads, no computers, no whatever. And I'm like, nope. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, like so weird. Like, we have, like books and like little <laughs> things to do, and we like talk to our kids. You know, it's like, yeah, it's they weird. never played like no. video games ever. And you know, I, you know, they may take your phone to listen to music or something like that, but never videos or anything like that and like she said that was, it was that the the security lady couldn't believe they had two little kids with no video no, four hour no flight. computers no, no, no computers, ipad no nothing like, no we no we have books for him to read and they were like, you know what the, it stems from you guys and that's what i'm talking about the examples and and uh you know it's nothing that drives me more crazy and like you said, I've heard the same thing before when you're homeschool your kids, you know, they're not going to have any social life. Well, you watch people in a restaurant, father, mother, all the children, uh, and they're supposed in the schools. But what everyone is sitting at the table, even the parents on their cell phone, yeah, waiting for I, their yeah, food. We don't do it. And so to me, that's not socializing. Right. Yeah. What socializing is that? And I think in these video games, truly the mindset when you, you know, if I shoot somebody and kill them, all I have to do is hit reset and we go yes. again. And, and this image in our head, and I truly believe, you know, it isn't the gun, it isn't the rock, you know, the, it, it's it's the people behind it. And, and um, what I'm trying to say is that they lose the value of what life is. And Gene Wenzel, a friend of mine, told me one time that what he did was teaching his kids about the, the guns and and what guns can do and how important but how careful you have to be he took him out one in the summer and uh, shot a woodchuck and made the shot and showed the kids and walked up and had him look at the woodchucks and see this gun that's what that you pull that trigger that's what this gun can do it's dead and he said i went back about three or four days later took him back again and see this woodchuck he's still dead this dead is permanent so when you handle a gun and we shoot something, there's a, there's something that happens that you can't redo. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was a cool thing that, you know, right. he taught him that death is real and, and, and a gun can be used in good things, but it's permanent. There's it's no rewind. Fun. Right. Like yeah. on those video games, just desensitize stuff. Like you said, it's like, oh, we can do a redo. It's like, no, you don't get redos, you know? And I even. And the language. Like, oh, my goodness. Terrible even the suicide rate and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I saw this thing about a couple months ago and it was about like depression. And they're like, you know why we didn't have any depression back in the great depression and all that kind of stuff. It's because we didn't have time. We were outside, we were working, you were doing stuff together as a family, you were eating together, you were providing food, you were gardening, you were doing all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's gotten lost. And, you know, I know people will say, well, you guys could do that. It's easy for you. It's like, no, it's not. It's not easy for us. It's like, like I said, there's a lot of things that I'm like, crap, I really wish I could do that. And I'm like, well, I'm like, unless they can come with, I'm not doing it, you know? So it's like a active choice. And of course we're very blessed and our show is successful and stuff, but you know what? I guarantee you, if Lee was just a farmer, we'd be doing the same thing mm -hmm. and I would be home with him. Oh, absolutely. Somebody needs to yeah, be home I, with them, is what we yeah, believe. I, 
Right. We both yeah. had both of our parents. We both had good parents that were, you know, instilled the same, similar type things into us. And I just want, like, even for our kids, it was just to, I want to, I want them to have the childhood that I had. Yeah. I thought it was awesome yeah. for both of us. I mean, that's that me and my neighbor, Paul, said we'd be every day in summer up catching frogs and putting up minnow traps to go fishing with. And I mean, we just had such a great time, you know, on stuff. And you just don't see that thing of it's kind of, kind of lost in in kids today and that's a we don't hardly let our kids watch tv but if we do it's like it's John it's Gilli Reed gilligan's and island and, and just, they John watch just the shows yeah. that we did when we were kids because it's like <laughs> even even like the the kids stuff like when they they do watch like a cartoon or like a, a modern cartoon it's always some villain on there there's always somebody doing something bad and somebody else and i'm just like and they always pick up on that for some reason and it's like why does there always have to be a bad guy here? Let's watch, you know, Gilligan's Island and, and uh, you know, a lot of those shows that we used to watch, there was, it was just good comedy or humor. There was no villain in every single show. And it's like, well, there has to be a bad guy and somebody has to be shooting somebody with a laser gun or something. It's just like, okay, let's just go back. And so like every night now, Cameron just loves cowboy stuff. So we just watched like i don't know the last couple last week we just had like a little thing going on every yeah, night okay you want to watch a cowboy movie we watch like john wayne oh john wayne movies and things like that so you know really? so old reruns of gunsmoke you watch any old reruns of gunsmoke i do <laughs> oh yeah he loves the gunsmoke yeah. too yeah well he walks around right now he's got because he got uh for his birthday he got this little sheriff's badge and and two and yeah two, double like, holster double holster cap guns and stuff i mean that's how all his young kids grew up wanting to be cowboys and had the fake guns yeah. and you know and it, it, it and, and i'm gonna tell you right now guys we sit and talk about it and it there's not i don't scratch my head i know where it's coming from i know it's been a plan it's a plan to attack our young and it's time to, to attack us you know it's a plan to destroy the families i this is this wasn't just by coincidence, you know, things were happening. They were allowed because people wanted to have control. They want to have control of your kids. Now you got uh, states saying that they're going to have control of your kid more than you. And um, yeah. so this was all the plan. We believe that, and, you know, you can go to school and you can have a, the, the Quran or you can talk about, you know, Muhammad or anything like that. But you have a kid say prayer, even the Pledge of Allegiance under God, you, you know, indivisible. You can't even say that. And yeah. anything, it's attack on a certain religion. It's attack on certain things. I understand that. I know where, so I pretty much know what the battle is. And then I know how I'm going to fight it. And I'm a true believer that what you guys are doing is instilling and you're instilling a uh, character, but you're also instilling goodness and morality that we don't have anymore. And I totally believe that we are the protectors of our kids. And I believe that everything that our biggest power that we have is ourselves, but also prayer. And I truly believe that, you know, that we all sit here and have the prayer. And, and I believe that there's power in there and we can't even pray anymore. People don't want to pray on TV. And especially if you mention a certain name. So this is all by design and kudos to you guys for, you know, trying to control that and, and to stop that and, and um right I just, so anyway you just need more of that it's just like you, you know we were just talking about the other day too like the the school shootings and stuff like that and they wanted they of course they just blame it on guns and you're like how many of those how, how many of those kids had two parents how many of them had a good family how many of them ever went to church with their parents how many of them went to vacation with their parents how many of them really spent time and hung out with their family and sat at a dinner table and talked together and stuff I, I, it's zero. Had a, I mean, you know, it's like zero. I said, I, I, obviously I realize not all families are like that, but it, in the same token, I look at my brother-in-law who brings all these boys out, you know, playing basketball and stuff. And it's like, you know, some of them are from really bad situations, but they have at least sports or something that, you know, they have mm -hmm. to bring them, you know, like discipline give them, and give them, give them, give them a purpose and, and you know, chance like and stuff. So it's like, like I said, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it. I mean, because like I said, I, you know, obviously there's a lot of broken families out there and families that can't do necessarily what we're doing. But I look at him and I'm like, well, that's, that's, that's that's the, thing that, the thing that you're saying is just like, OK, that's that's the result of some of those policies. I mean, yeah, you look at like, um, you know, just morality in general. You look at when we were kids, I mean, you watch the Dick Van Dyke show. I mean, they were two separate beds. They couldn't even have the. 
the same bed and all that stuff. And it's not. But it's, that's it's not, not normal. It's not. It's not <laughs> us. It's not us that are like, okay, no, you should, you should, you should watch Teen Mom. You should have kids outside of marriage. Hey, you, you, we don't need a nuclear family. It, it's not conservative people like me. And it's like, okay, now you have, you know, I thought it was ludicrous when they put, you know, in high schools, um, you know, uh, daycares in there. I was like, shouldn't you be kind of like trying to deter that and not, you know, saying that that's okay? And I think so. I guarantee you, most of these people that are having these problems with school shootings and stuff, it's like they're, you, you, if you have a 15 or 16 year old, you know, girl having a baby and they're not babies themselves. And what chance does that kid have to be a great, you know, have great role models and stuff? And they're just kids themselves. That's not that stuff like that doesn't happen. You don't understand, but I just don't see promoting it you know, and just, and just making it okay. And having, no like it's, yeah, I mean, to have like the teen mom shows and it's like, Hey, yeah, this is all awesome. You have a baby when you're 15 and you'd be on a TV show and promoting all that stuff. And it's just like, you know, well, just think about the kid for a second here, because, um, I was like, I can't know, even imagine. I mean, it rocked my world. I was 40 when we had our first and I was like, Oh, Holy cow, boy, that rocked my world. Some days it still rocks my world where I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's I just like, it's not, it's not my, our policies really for the conservative people. I mean, you know, not that everyone's that, but I'm speaking for myself. It's like, I would never think that that's okay. I would never, you know, promote that. Even, even abortion and stuff like that. I'm not saying I'm sitting on one side or the other, but don't you think instead of, everybody out there just saying yeah let's go have abortions don't you think that maybe they should sit down with people and talk to them about options or you know How things like that especially yeah especially when you you know when you get older like this we see so many people that couldn't have kids that are trying so hard i know like three like right now at this moment that are trying to have kids and can't and you don't don't think they could sit down and talk to them and say look there's so many people that you know that could you, Better, you would yeah. you would save their lives two people's three people's lives four people's lives in this if you would just consider that but they never talk to them about that it's never like okay let's go have some counseling first and then you can make your decision it's always just hey no just go do it just go do it you know but there's just i think there's just so many moral things that were different back when our parents were alive than they are today and i think that's why you're seeing so much of this society you know like the, the school shootings and stuff like that look when we were kids my buddy we used to have our guns in our truck. We were, we were duck and goose hunting every day before. It never mattered like that. Even John Beneke, he was a friend of ours. He's a little bit older. He's probably 65 or 67, yeah. maybe now. But he went to school in Minnesota, uh, down in uh, was Rochester. down by Rochester. He would bring his shotgun into, into school every day. He, he had a little bike, a little motorcycle that he would take. He'd go goose hunting every morning before school, bring his shotgun right in. The teacher say, hey, how did you shoot? get anything this morning, John? Yep, yep, no, whatever. But that was the way it was because you just knew there wasn't any danger of somebody having a gun even in the high school. And could you imagine that now? We have I mean, kids just, over just, all the time, and there's, I mean, you're careful, but there's guns. I mean, yeah, like there's not guns one around kid all over. Around. Yeah, everybody that is, you know, we that we homeschool. There's a big home. Uh, there's a yeah, lot of people that homeschool. Yeah, we have a big homeschool group, group that they get together and do stuff every week, and they they're going to. We're going to a goat farm tomorrow. A goat farm tomorrow, yeah. So they do something with the whole group and they're always doing something. And it can be archery. They came to our house to do jerky making stuff. And there's like 40 kids yeah. almost, and, or people anyway, doing almost that. 50. And then, you know, some one week it could be archery yeah, and one week it could be, <laughs> and could you're be something. And you're like newborns all the way up to like 17, you know, it's like. Right. That's so cool. It really, so it really cool. was cool, honestly. But, but it's, I mean, it's family doing stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Look at people that's like, you know, just want to say, oh, you don't need a nuclear family and all that kind of stuff. You don't need to just let the schools take care of it, you know, and your teachers. And you can see how easy it is to, you know, indoctrinate somebody into whatever you want. You know, but you just look at it around here, you know, your kids, like you're the ones that discipline them and stuff. And we have, you know, a friend of ours, Donnie, who works for us. He comes over and it's always, oh, it's Uncle Donnie. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think. They, Oh, what? <laughs> but you just like okay they're not the people that have to discipline they're not the ones that make them have to brush their teeth they're not the ones that hey you have to come in from outside to eat dinner and stuff so it's easy for them because it's like you know it's like this is the fun the, the fun, fun person guy. over here you know yeah. so it's like it's easy on kids that's what we're saying we're just gonna homeschool make sure until they're 16 or 
whenever that you feel like, okay, they're smart enough now, they've got a sense now, they can make their own decisions at this point. But, you know, until they get to that age where I figure that they'll, then they'll be fine on their own. My sister's son, you know, and, and uh, he's got all like his, all his, you know, things, all his buddies in, in basketball, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's black kids, there's white kids, there's all kinds of different guys. And yeah. to us, like for us, that's the way kind of we grew up. It's like, Who cares? like our kids at the yeah, first time, like you had a, you know, saw a, a black person. We're just like, oh, that's just their skin's just different color. Just like you were, you know, you have blue pants on and I have brown exactly. pants on. It's just a color. And it's just like, you know, just like that. And like, oh, never ask another thing about it. And so, but it's right. like time in your life that you're just super innocent, like was when you were a kid, like your parents were never going to die and everything gets sick. I mean, everything was awesome. It was summer and it was like, it was always just fun. And I just see these kids that they're just trying to, you know, so much on their shoulders. They, yeah, they're yeah. just trying to put all this stuff on them, you know, with, you know, color stuff and race stuff and all that stuff. It's like, just let kids Gender. be kids for, that's the one time when they have just carefree. Why are you starting this stuff at three and four years old? You're not doing that to mine because my kids are going to have the same kind of childhood that I did. They can deal with all that stuff when they're old enough to deal with it. But the, like I said, the one time in life that you have where it just totally, everything's totally innocent. They, they, you know, when you get older, there's all the things with parents getting yeah, sick and dying and cancer and all this stuff. When you're a kid, there is none of that. It's the one time in your life that's just total bliss. It's like, why take that away from them? They're not taking it away from ours. There was one word that I say that, and, and it's totally grew. I mean, when there, there wasn't racism until they start talking about it. Mm -hmm. We've come so right. far. And everybody knows that. You know, everybody knows that. that. But what they do know, there's one word that they work on. And if you can take that away from somebody, you can destroy and you can own and, and control them. And it's called hope. And that's what they're doing. They're taking the hope away from young kids. We're taking hope away from America. I have to quit watching the news because it doesn't matter what news it is because there's so much negative and what's going on. I know that there's negative and actually I have to pull away from it because it starts collecting my thoughts and it starts, you know, right. the positive when the, when the negative starts outweighing the positive and then that's when we start failing. Right. And um, I'm going to change a little bit and just kind of move on to something, which is awesome what wow. we talked about because I, th I hope that a lot of the listeners are listening to this podcast you know, people that who follow you and have a lot of respect for you. I think your advice and what you guys just talked about is so important to me. It's more important than, than knowing how to make scrapes and how to raise big deer. <laughs> so it's how to raise kids. I do. I think that is totally awesome. God bless you. Um, but are, and I know you guys are busy, but are you guys a turkey hunters and you're getting ready for the oh, turkey yeah. season or is it? Oh yeah. yeah that's what we were doing right away. When you, when you text me, I'm just getting my, uh, we just got a new savage just sent us a new 410 with like a thumb hole stock because we got i've got my old 410s that i used when i was a kid but it's so much easier today like with your kids starting to have a red dot you know if they don't get their face down on it perfectly or whatever sure. and, and, you know like i know our old 410s just smooth barrel with the bead on the on the end you know just to it's just nice for them to be successful right away so put like a we have these little sig red dots that we mount on them so they didn't have my old ones didn't have any you know they weren't tapped or anything that you could put a rail on them so um beth over at Savage, a friend of ours and yeah so yeah so she just sent us a little thumb hole stock uh four tents are just getting ready to go pattern it and get that sight on for them because the youth season opens on saturday and even reagan who just will turn six in uh, two days and on april 6th um you know she wants to shoot her first turkey so we're just trying to get everything you know set up for pretty excited about it you know we're not outside working today which that works out good to do podcasts to kind of look at it when we have like bad weather coming or raining and it's it's not raining right now but it's supposed to be strong thunderstorms and so i know you live in iowa so you probably hear see the same thing and the one we just had and stuff so uh yeah that's if I'm, we're not out uh burning or hinge cutting or you know fertilizing or doing something it's because there's bad weather coming that's where why we're doing other things 
Friday night, we sat there at the Illinois Deer Classic, and it's the first time I can have been on a show that they made us go stand against the wall. That tornado came right through there outside of Peoria, and they told everybody to go stand and remind me being back in school. And we all had to stand uh, against yeah. the wall. Yeah. Remember but, back uh, when we had to go do all the drills and things like that for it, too. So the kids, and do you basically just hunt turkeys around the house? Do you guys travel? You know, do you go to the west part? Do you, you know, or is that pretty much your turkey hunting at home? With me and my schedule, it's pretty much at home because it, you know I'd love to go to all the states and shoot a super, you know, grand slam of turkeys, but you know I just don't have the time. Yeah, I mean it just kind of depends. We plan on some like last year we went to Texas, and not with them, but ourselves. They came with us, but they weren't, they weren't hunting, hunting hunting there. But most of the time with them, it's here because you have all the time in the world. It's not, you know, a lot of times when we go places or something else, you know, it's like a lot of cost involved. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, I might, we bought a place out in Montana. So we're thinking about maybe going out there because I got to design, put in some food plots and get it all laid out for elk stuff out there. But we have lots of turkeys out there too. So we thought, hey, you know, I think it, but turkey season opens on april 15th out in montana i believe so like well let's get the kids done this hunt here some and we'll see if we get a weather break that we can a good time we can run out to montana and maybe we would a uh, turkey hunt out there but it's just a lot easier on your own places when you have you can come and go as you want and things that look you know a lot of times if you're going to other states it might be well, a lot of times for us it's with friends or someone that you know somebody but if you're going like an outfitter it's not that easy just to go out on your own and do your own thing you know so which like is what we like to do when all kinds of hunting you know we'd like to kind of do it ourselves anyway but uh you know so it's just easier that way that's coming quick and you're, you're actually gonna do uh, food plots out in montana too oh yeah and you guys yeah, first yeah. i mean wow. it's eastern montana and really and that in that part of Montana, it's like food is king. You know, they get giant bulls out oh, yeah. there, huge bulls, you know. But again, you know, you need to have if you have some alfalfa. I mean, they'll move around a lot. They're not like deer, you know, they travel long distances but and stuff. But if you have some some nice alfalfa fields or you know, late planted millet fields and water, I mean not just food, water and have all the, you know, if you have any tanks and overflow for wallows and make sure, you know, just kind of design it and just you know, it takes years to just like deer farm, but it takes a long time. But we're gonna we'll get a start on it and get uh, some at least some alfalfa and stuff, some big fields planted, and and start to get to work on it. Very smart, very smart. Uh, when you ride your tractors, there's probably which song is your favorite? My International Harvester, or she thinks my tractors. <laughs> which one are you? I can see Lee out there. Just which one are you singing? <laughs> uh, just all, just any of them or all of them. You know, I won't. I won't. Yeah, start there you go. I, yeah, I have, I have friends that sing some of a couple of those songs. I don't want to single one of them out. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my friend, what's so cool is that, you know, the, a lot of times the stereotyping and, and the people, you know, when they see people being successful, killing big animals, well, you know, they just, they got it made and they just show up and, and man, that's not the case with you and Tiffany. I, I, I love to hear the work, not that you, you, you're doing with your own family, but the work that you're instilling in, you know, to have what you have, you're working for what you have and not just there. I mean, you go and what you're doing in another state, I mean, it, it's commitment and it's dedication and it, it, it takes work and that, right. that formula will success. And that is what we need to get back to the world today. We've lost, you know, I was a manufacturer for so long and uh, with Michigan, you know, so we had the big three there and you learned, you know, we were, we were the manufacturing guru. Now, you know, now I'm in the call industry and there's some components that we're trying to get made. And it is so tough trying to get stuff machined here. It's trying to get the work done. People who don't keep their word and we've kind of got the, you know, I'll do it, but I, it'll be months away. And then we're going to inflate the price because it's going to take so long. And yet, you know, people can call overseas and they say, when do you need it? And hey. we've lost that. We've lost that. And that's what, you know, uh, God bless Donald Trump when he came in, but he was talking about he was going to bring jobs back here. And I'm sitting here and said, man, I've seen it. What's going on? Our young generation lost their manufacturing guts. The, you know, the, 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 you know, it's easy to have someone else do it for us. 
And that's what we got to get instilled. And I think, Lee, it's so awesome. You're a prime example of what a true red-blooded American kid coming up, you know, with a good, clean, wholesome background, instilling that, but taking your work ethics out into the field. And I think that is just, I tip my hat to you. I mean, truly yeah, respect. Man. I'm so glad that I got to sit and and this, spend this time with you to get to know the real Lee and Tiffany Lakoski. And that's what my purpose was in this podcast, because, you know, people know you, they watch your shows. It's on, you know, all the time. And it's a great production you do. It's family oriented. But in this podcast, I wanted to get a part of knowing you guys that they can't see because there's only 30 minutes uh, on a podcast right. your For TV sure. show. For and sure. it is, I hope the viewers will enjoy this as much as I have and gained a lot of respect like I have with you guys. And I truly hope that our audience or someone out there that, that some of these men, these young men coming into hunting, and I see a lot of this, that they choose. And like you said, I love hunting, but I would never choose hunting over my family. And that comes a part of, you know, we have to be responsible for what we're doing. And like you guys, you're sacrificing, your kids come, and you know that's something that a responsibility you inherited, you not really inherited, you guys actually brought upon, but you accepted that role and you're doing, you're knocking it out of the park. And I hope someone listening to this, some of the young guys who are wanting to be, you know, make a name or whatever they're wanting to do in hunting, you know, it can be done, but make a plan, but always put that family first before anything else. It takes a lot and, of work. Dedication and work is what it is. Just like any job. It's, if you want to be successful at anything, it's going to take a lot of work. So you got to be prepared for that no matter what you do. Yep. Well, how much time we got, hon? Oh, I got 10 minutes. Anything else you want to add? I mean, more, more that you want to add to talk? I mean. Well, I think that's just what we've been saying. we talking about kids so much on this. We can do another podcast anytime talking about hunting stuff because we could talk that all day. But you know, it's like with the kids stuff, it's, that's kind of one of the main things is like why we, when we said we school year round, because we don't, we're not that strict. If I'm out working a tractor, something that I think that he should learn or in the skid steers, we're doing work on, you know, CRP stuff. I mean, Cameron and yeah, they can, yeah. Cameron can drive. Well, she's not quite old enough yet, but Cameron can drive yeah. the skid steers and tractors and do all that stuff. I mean, that's a dang, that's a, a learning skill as well so we feel that you know if he's out in the tractors or well reagan too but she you know she's just getting to that age now where she can probably start driving you know some of that stuff, some of this stuff. Yeah. but um you know that's part of it too is just it's not all about the reading and writing and that kind of stuff it's hey you need to learn you know the, the how valuable it is to have a good work ethic and be out you know, doing things and working well, with your hands. And, and, you know, obviously we got some guys that work with us and you're out helping and learning about controlled burns and why we do that, you know? So it's like a lot, that's why we have to be a little flexible because at any given day, Lee's like, okay, it's dry enough, we're going to burn. It's like, uh, okay, so. Yeah, and there's a lot know, of things that we figure they should be out there with out there us for and it. they should be learning that. But a lot of it is, like I said, we just want to instill a work ethic in them. Like my dad worked, he was, he was, mm -hmm a cement guy and bricklayer and stuff so I, a truck driver. and Tiffany is the truck driver but I my dad worked like every weekend we had seven kids so I mean he worked I every worked single weekend from all of you guys. <laughs> I know that's the way I mean, that's my joke with him you know when when he was alive I'd say yeah you worked every weekend it was I'm now I and you know growing up I thought it's hey because you needed to put clothes on all seven kids but now when I have two myself I was like you probably you probably working every weekend to get the heck out of the house with seven kids in there <laughs> but, for a little bit of peace and quiet but seven yeah. kids. <laughs> but he worked you know every weekend and you saw that so i'd go work with him a lot on the weekends where he'd pay us you know make some extra money and stuff so you know you kind of instilled that and then my grandparents were you know obviously came here and lived through the great depression so their whole thing was work 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 and be self-sufficient and you know i remember being up there cutting wood and stuff every day there was always chores to do and things to do but i think that's how you get a good work ethic i think you know a lot of kids today if they just want to sit on their video games and things like that i think that's what you're really going to start seeing in the future here is and like i said there's already a problem trying to find workers and and well you see us i've been outside the whole time actually the only reason i'm even looking is because she keeps bringing piles of water out and i'm like <laughs> <"What's> <laughs> <water from?" laughs> but uh yeah so, I mean, so, but i just think that you're the kids that are 
you know, if they got a good work ethic and stuff, they're going to kill it in the future here because I, I don't think every kid is getting that, that, you know, instilling a work ethic in them. So I mean, it's just making it easier for, I mean, people in general, not just kids yeah, people in like general is just trying to make life easier. And of course you, you want to do that, but you still have to, anything you want to do, it's, you're going to have to work hard at it. And like you just talk about, if you want to be a professional football player, of course you have to be gifted that way too, but it's going to take years of work from the time you're five years old, just work, 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 work to get there. But it's no different even, you know, for any job, you want to be a doctor, it's going to be take a lot of work. I mean, years and years of school and working and working hard. It's no different. You want to have, you know, a beautiful place to hunt and to do the TV show like we do. We just work, 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 work. I mean, there's no weekends off. We're doing it all the time. So if you, if you, if, you know, people always ask, oh, how, how, you know, kids are asking, how do we get into the, you know, the hunting industry and say, well, number one, he had to go do very well in school. They, 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 can't, they don't get that, but it's like, look, the first people that I talked to were all the companies you have to go out to and, and sell yourself on them. And okay, why are they going to oh, give you any money on it? And, and even from just emails or texts, I can, somebody can email me or something and, and you can tell right away from their punctuation and everything right in an email who you're dealing with a lot of times. So it's like he's, my, my he's mom was a punctuation. Yeah. my mom was a my wife one. has to do mine I, I give mine to Diane I was thinking the same thing I'm like I am terrible but yeah my mom was an English teacher so we always were on that but you know just even uh you know you can tell a lot of things are just like it, like I said if you're putting a resume out there or something just the way yeah, and the way that you can communicate with people and all that stuff so don't don't just focus on hunting. You got to think about education and other things that are going to be important life skills for you too. Um, and not that, not that there's that, that, that necessary, but you know, you, you want to push them in that direction because it certainly helped me. Cause I mean, like I said, if I didn't, I mean, if I wasn't, if I hadn't had years of school and stuff like that, just, just force you to make better business decisions and things like that. Once you've been you know, like I said, that kept me mentioned, I was a chemical engineer and worked at a big company. So you know how to talk to people, you know how to interact with people, how to work on a team, you know, that kind of stuff and just all help getting, getting there. But once you're here, it's just, it's all got to outwork the next guy. And it's basically every single day, we don't have weekends off. We don't, you know, it's like, if, if we go, if I can go do something like, like I said, sighting in guns or doing something like that, even though that's part of work, it's mostly, Hey, is the how, what's the weather doing? If it rains, Hey, and when we go fishing or go up to our cabin, okay, it rain, or at least we got everything done. We don't, I can, I can take a week off before I got to start fertilizing again for fall plots or, or whatever. But a lot of it will be weather dependent. And it's the only time that we go do something is okay. It rained. We got a couple of days. Let's go do something, you know, but it, just instilling a work into ethic into people. They don't realize they think, oh, you can just slough off all year and then blow the dust off your, your bow on October 1st to go out and shoot a big deer or, whatever so now it doesn't work that way i was i would relate to like a to the golf course is that you don't learn to golf on a golf course you spend thousands of hours on a putting green and driving range and do all that stuff you just go to the golf course to see what you've learned to put try to put it all together and then okay i gotta go back to the drawing board i get to the putting greens and all that kind of stuff I said that hunting season is the golf course you get to go to that you know all the work is in the summer you know you know leading up to it but it's you know, it's not because we have a great farm. It's because we made it a great farm. You have people that will say, oh man, if I could hunt your farm, I could, I, I could kill a big deer too. And I was like, well, yeah, you probably could, but that's the house that we built. Nobody cared about it before we bought it. When it was like, I would say Elsie Craig's is the first place that we bought. And it's like, nobody was all anxious to, to sit on Elsie Craig's fence lines when she had it. But it, you know, it's what we did with it after that. And that's just like anything, there's no farm that's just inherently, uh, this is the best farm. It's what you do with it and all the work that goes into, into it. And it, whether it's duck hunting or deer hunting or whatever it is, whatever you want to do, it's going to take a lot of work and dedication to, to get it to where you want to be. I'm constantly trying to work with people. We do things online. Guys will come in and it's little classes and run and teach them run calls and stuff, you know, and I have, and because baseball is my whole life. And I agree with you. Baseball is done in the cage and in the gym, not on the field. Right. You know, you're building same way, you know, but I had the same with coaching guys in baseball and coaching guys in, in waterfowl is that practice doesn't make perfect, 
perfect practice makes perfect mm -hmm. doing the right way first you know and another thing i think that i would contribute to a lot of the success that i just picked up with you guys right there that i think a lot of people are missing is that husband and wife being connected together that you guys are on the same page and so many times the fighting back and forth kids pick that up and they if there's oh, yeah. not security and within yourselves you know there's got to be unity and then that same unity, the discipline comes from both, not just from one. And that is so cool. And that's, I think, another thing that's missing today, and that's the unity. And maybe it's because there's so many divorces and, you know, so many, and it's, you know, the kids only know what they learn or whatever's been processed to them. So, you know, kudos to you guys. And I thank you so much for taking your time. Diane's nodding her head over here. It's so awesome to mm -hmm. have you guys. And I can't wait to, to get in the field with you guys and, you know, have to have some more conversations and, and put some, uh, I always call it tipping toenails. I like to go out and tip some toenails, whether it's a deer or waterfowl, <laughs> coyote, but I appreciate your time and, and your honesty. And man, I hope the people you like this, please subscribe, go to the uh, George Lynch Hunter podcast. You can go to our on YouTube. It's legendary gear with George Lynch. You can subscribe there and um, you guys, the crush, and you are crushing it on there. And what nights is that on in, in the outdoor channel? What nights is it? On a bunch, but our yeah. main night is Sunday, Sunday yeah. at 8 p.m. Eastern time. But it's on pretty much every night now nowadays. Awesome. awesome. Well, guys, I appreciate it. And, and um, I can't wait to get in the field. And, folks, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And always remember, hunt safe, hunt smart. May the good Lord be your guide. Well, I'll be in there, rain is shining. All a part of the great design Bring it on, I can never get enough Because that's what legends are made of